Melanoma is the most deadly form of skin cancer, and it arises from melanocytes, which are the pigment-producing cells in the skin, those responsible for causing a tan, at least in those individuals who can tan. And uh, that's an example of the fact that any cell in the body could become cancerous, but melanoma, when it becomes cancerous, can be quite um, the traveler and life-threatening type of cancer. We still don't have a full answer to why melanoma wouldn't respond to the types of chemotherapy drugs that were developed from the 1950s to the 1990s, but it's not alone in that regard. Um, some argue that uh, it is the phenomenon that a melanocyte, the pigment-producing cell from which these tumors arise, are very hardy cells. They live in the, out, in the periphery, the outskirts, if you will, um, exposed to ultraviolet radiation lifelong um, and suffer through that and survive through that. Um, but when they become cancerous, unfortunately, maintain that hardiness. Melanoma is not alone amongst other cancer types um, in its ability to hibernate in a very small quantity of cells. Um, that's true following the initial diagnosis of melanoma. A tiny microscopic deposit can establish itself at some distant site remain dormant for not just months, but years, and then all of a sudden start to grow exponentially in size and become life-threatening. And the same is true following treatment response, that one can beat down the cancer uh, to a tiny, uh, un undetectable uh, level, um, and yet a, a few cells, a nest, if you will, uh, can hibernate and then uh, perform the same trick of, of waking up someday. We think that is largely due to the fact that recreational sun exposure really began um, a few decades back in the 1950s and 60s and then just became more and more the social norm. Uh, the cost of traveling um, has gone down substantially in that same period of time, such that you have uh, people from this fair country uh, taking uh, discount uh, you know, air carriers down to latitudes that they never could have uh, traveled to uh, you know, on a... On a, on a uh, typical salary. And, and that occasional sun exposure, we think, just, just intense exposure for even a week or two out of the year um, is likely enough to account for the increase, not, not, not a change in, in climate or, uh, or sun exposure in, in the home environment. The sun emits ultraviolet radiation, and ultraviolet radiation is one of the types of radiation that can uh, cause the genetic code to be scrambled. Um, that's a relatively random event. Um, if you look at a melanoma cell, the amount of ultraviolet-related genetic alterations is enormous. Most of those are biologically irrelevant, but a few of them are the key clicks in the combination lock that cause cancer to arise. And the safest way is just to block all of them. There's no question that, that the preventative maneuver in melanoma is to avoid sun exposure. Talk to me about the hope that was raised because, you know, you've described how melanoma has been one of the worst outcome cancers, the, one of the worst in terms of resisting treatment. Talk to me about the hope that came along in the past couple of years in terms of targeted therapies for melanoma. So understanding the genetic code in cancer uh, was a process that began in earnest back in the early to mid-1980s, uh, but really just a trickle of information pouring in at that time. By the 90s, a good bit more, and then by the 2000s, all at once, the cancer genetic code has really been uh, resolved uh, with um, uh, impressive and almost shocking uh, alacrity. In melanoma, um, the key piece of the puzzle fell into place in the early 2000s, uh, in 2002, um, and the rest of the puzzle has been unraveled in that in just the few, first few years after that time. And that has really given us uh, our map uh, of what, how we would build molecularly targeted therapy for this disease. It took us a few years longer than we would have liked to actually turn those genetic discoveries into therapy. Um, but that is the simple underpinning of, of what accounts for the therapeutic revolution that we've witnessed. And tell me the story of BRAF. So BRAF is uh, the most commonly genetically altered molecule that is capable 
in and of itself of contributing to a large part to melanoma formation and the bad behaviors of melanoma, meaning uncontrolled growth as well as spread elsewhere, uh, to some degree even resistance to classical chemotherapy drugs. Uh, it's not alone, it's never alone, in terms of other genetic alterations that are critical building blocks in a melanoma cell, but it sits at the top of the pyramid. It is the single most important when it's found. Um, and that was discovered in 2002 as a mutation that can occur within the same year it was shown that actually if you could alter BRAF in a non-drug way initially, that that could uh, significantly bother a melanoma cell. Um, but to be able to take advantage of this information for humans, one needed a drug, something that you could give by mouth or by intravenous infusion or some way, somehow, get it in the body, throughout the body, to wherever a melanoma cell might be. Um, and that's the breakthrough that took seven years, um, ultimately, from the time of BRAF mutations being discovered in about half of all melanomas to a drug finally causing tumors to shrink uh, in real patients with that mutation. And a drug like dubrafenib, that's acting as a roadblock, is it, to the cancer cell growing? Correct. It's, uh, it does more than that, though. Um, it is true that BRAF uh, contributes to cell growth, and when you block BRAF uh, in a real patient's tumor, the tumors will stop growing, but they will actually become dismantled to some degree as well. So it's, uh, it, it, it actually contributes to even just their survival, much less their growth. Um, so a substantial fraction of the tumor cells will die, um, and tumors will shrink, uh, quite reliably, in fact, with about 90% of patients who receive a BRAF inhibitor having some degree of tumor shrinkage, which is, seems like a shocking number, but it in, in fact is the type of number that has been seen over and over again in several cancer types where this top-of-the-pyramid genetic alteration has been successfully targeted with the drug. So there's the hope of this fantastic new medicine, these new kinds of medicines arriving along. Uh, then there's the heartbreak of relapse. Tell me what happens and why, and describe the patterns of relapse as well. Well, recall that there is no such thing as a genetically simple cancer in the adult population. Melanoma certainly fits that definition of being a relatively complicated entity. Uh, it takes more than just a BRAF mutation to get a melanoma. And if you only target a BRAF mutation, you will leave others to essentially um, uh, can relate to cell survival ultimately and then uh, the workaround, if you will, um, strategies by which the effect of a BRAF inhibitor can be bypassed, even when a patient is still on the drug through that entire time. Um, it's a lot like trying to treat an infection but doing so with a, a sort of half the dose of the antibiotics or, or taking only half the course. Uh, of antibiotics, that if you don't eradicate the problem, um, it will come back. And uh, most people are aware of the example in HIV, where in uh, roughly the mid-1990s, the first effective drug against HIV came along. It was at the time referred to as AZT. And that drug by itself would reliably lower the viral loads, but temporarily. And then the virus came right on back but two drug and three drug therapy have turned HIV into a chronic disease. And that's exactly the model we're going after in cancer. Melanoma, we've got BRAF as a starting point. We've already built a two drug combination that we think is twice as good as single agent therapy. But we recognize that in a cancer like melanoma, it's going to take this type of cocktail, three drugs perhaps, maybe even more, um, to actually turn it hopefully not just into a chronic disease, but a curable disease. It means this is a particularly tantalizing time, doesn't it? Because, you know, there are new medicines appearing, but not quite enough yet to be making the difference you'd want. Well, that statement is true in the melanoma population, and it's true across the cancer population. That we have now, uh, through a genetic understanding, gained insights into how we would start to target with one drug um, in 30% of all cancers. If we could just resolve the problems of chemistry and developing effective drugs for targets that have been discovered, we could be up to 60 or 70 percent. But again, this is single drug approaches. And the key point with this targeted therapy revolution is that we are just at the beginning. We know combinations will be necessary. And so the question not just becomes when can we cover 100 percent of all cancers with a targeted therapy approach but how quickly can we accelerate into combination therapies? And we're just at the beginning of that process.
There's no doubt that cancer is about the most complex condition uh, which with we can be afflicted, um, much more complicated than the HIV virus or any bacterium. Um, cancer cells, like every cell in our body, have 60,000 genes in them. Cancer cells activate programs, behaviors that they're not supposed to have access to. Um, and recognizing the, the impressive evolutionary drive, if you will, of cancer cells, one has to be cautious in, in suggesting um, that we will resolve the problem within a very short time. I would say what the past 10 years have taught us, which we refer to as the first chapter of the targeted therapy era in cancer, is that we can chip away at this problem. That basically, if we don't pretend that all cancer is one thing, we don't even consider one type of cancer to be one thing, but we start to use molecular and genetic definitions where we can match and reduce the problem to a, a tractable uh, issue that what we found over and over again is we can take a group of people for whom we had no effective therapy and now even with just one drug, essentially that whole group leapfrogs and now is doing better than even cancer populations that got at least some benefit from classical chemotherapy drugs. We all wish this would be 20, 30 percent of the cancer population at a time, but what's happening is we're finding it's a few percent here and there. When you consider that seven or eight percent of all cancers have BRAF mutations, we like to think that if we can just figure out the ticks and the combination lock for all of the BRAF mutant cancers, that'll be a significant chunk, but it's still only seven or eight percent. We've talked a lot about therapy um, and uh, ignoring the fact that every therapy that we've ever uncovered in cancer, be it classical chemotherapy drugs or this newer generation of targeted therapies, have a more profound impact the earlier in the course of cancer that they're given. Um, so not in the latest stage, um, not when uh, the cancer is widespread and symptomatic. Um, and that really uh, raises the critical importance, even for the therapeutics, to advance the diagnostic arena so that we're finding cancer at a much earlier point um, so that when a cancer is removed, the primary cancer, uh, be it a melanoma in the skin or a breast cancer in the breast, that we have a way of fingerprinting the travelers versus uh, the more indolent tumors that don't know how to travel so that we know who to give post-operative therapy to, um, limit the use of, of the therapies for those who could possibly get a benefit from it, um, and be able to treat even in this microscopic state um, where eradication is much more achievable than when patients have widespread symptomatic disease. I think an important point for people to understand is that a societal ethical agreement uh, with the scientific community is that we test new drugs in the worst scenario initially um, because we know so little about what their benefits or risks might entail but that our goal ultimately is to advance those therapies into a setting where cure is much more achievable, shorter duration of treatment is, is, is already the standard even with classical chemotherapy drugs. Um, and I think the diagnostic technology, the ability to molecularly um, predict uh, who might run into trouble if you don't give them further therapy following surgery, that is the other revolution that is occurring as we speak that will ultimately mm -hmm. make these therapies far more impactful. It's nearly 40 years since the war on cancer was declared. Will we ever win it? I think we'll win it if we're willing to accept the notion that we will gradually add 1% uh, by 1% by 1% to the win column, and that it won't be an overnight phenomenon, that we have effective therapy for all patients all at once. Um, it is very clear from this past 10 years that the trajectory is just getting ever steeper in a good way. Um, the per year breakthroughs in terms of real drugs for real patients um, have gone from occasional to reliable and several at a time. And I think it's reasonable to project that as we build combination therapies, as we start to take advantage of the opportunity to treat multiple different cancer types with the same targeted therapy approach, um, that we'll be able to actually multiply the rate. Um, it's still gonna take us some time we may still be left with a small group that have tumors that just won't budge, uh, but the ability to, to conquer this problem for the vast majority of patients within the next few decades, that's a reasonable hope.